pretty hard though, right? Yeah. How about getting enough rest? How about eating well? Not candy all the time, right? What else can you do? Nobody knows. Okay. Well, the, huh? Wear a mask. Wear a mask. <laughs> well, the flu's pretty sneaky. This is a really good way to do that. I can wear a mask all the time. I think I've got my mind. Amen. Amen. Get the flu shot. <laughs> the flu is sneaky. Can you see the flu? Yeah. No. Huh. So it's, uh, it could be on doorknobs. When somebody coughs, tell them to cough into their elbow. Wash your hands. Use hand sanitizer. You know what else is sneaky? Sin. Can you see sin? No. no. Do you know it's there? No. no, you don't. So, if you protect yourself from the flu by doing all those things that we just talked about, how can you protect yourself from sin? By praying to God. By praying to God, that's right. God gave us a toolbox, didn't he? Huh? Toolbox is in our Bible. What do we do? We pray, right? We read the Bible. We go to Sunday school. And what else do we do that's very important that we're doing here this morning? We have to spend time with other Christians, right? church family and be with other people who know Jesus and love Jesus. So this is what God said in Genesis about it. He said, if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. So sin is just waiting to pounce on us, just like, just like the flu. So we have to protect ourselves from the flu, and we have to protect ourselves from sin. So, we need to protect ourselves from a lot of different things, but especially sin. So well, let's pray about that. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will keep us safe and well. Please protect us from the flu and other illnesses, and please protect us from sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as you are able, and we'll join our hearts and voices as we sing hymn number 371, I Stand Amazed in the Presence, 371. <laughs>
let us join together in our prayer of confession as we acknowledge the reality that we stand in need of a Savior and forgiveness. Let us pray. Lord, we gather this day to question our assumptions in the light of the name of Jesus. We question our assumptions about others who believe differently, live differently, or look differently than we do. We question what we believe about ourselves and who we believe ourselves to be. Help us to examine what is most real in our lives and to consider carefully what we truly think about our relationship with you. May we live not by what we assume to be true, but rather by what you assure us is real. May we live into the grace and the transforming power that is ours through your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our greatest challenge and our deepest joy. Amen. we will have the sharing of Joyce concerns. Are there joys and concerns to be lifted up this day? I was well blessed the other day at BNC restaurant about 6.30 or 7 o'clock in the morning. The girls of quartet came in and sang to Bonnie Cleaner for Valentine's Day, requested, I guess, by her husband, I think so. So, I don't know who he's dressed. I hope it was. But, yeah, I was really blessed about that. Any other joys or concerns to be lifted up? Oh, there we go. Well, it's good to have Noah home again for a long weekend. Did some hunting with them. Uh, didn't kill too much, but we had a lot of laughs with the guys we hunt with. And uh, also, Jared uh, made it safely to Florida for his weight uh, weightlifting camp. And after the first day, he may have a job at the gym that he's training at. Yeah, to add to that uh, barbershop, that was a group that Bonnie worked with um, in high school. And Mr. Krebs back there can take a lot of pride in that too. He, he worked with those girls. And I think my opinion, those girls, they stayed together. Uh, they went and went to college and got married and had families and one thing and another. They could have been national champions. But uh, now they're back together. They're working at it. And uh, they really sound fantastic. So hopefully that's what they were working for to go to the Nationals, to participate in that down there. So hopefully keep, their, keep them in, their prayer, in your prayers that they get to be able to do that trip. So thank you. Are there any birthdays this week to celebrate? Any additional prayer cards to come forward? Friends, let's pray together as we lift up the uh, prayers that have been made known to us this day. Gracious God, we ask you to continue to heal and to restore and to strengthen all who have appeared on our prayer list. We also ask you to heal and strengthen and undergird Kenneth and May, Melissa, 
We pray your blessing on our summer camps as we prepare for them coming up very soon. We pray, Lord, health for Cindy, who is battling cancer. We pray for Sherry and Frank. We uh, also ask your blessing on Asher, who was born February, I'm sorry, yeah, February 13th. Lord, we pray for Laura Marsh, who was being treated for severe injuries from a tragic car accident in which her husband was killed. We continue our prayers for Gail. We pray for Bonnie. And we pray for Blake, who is going to undergo surgery in March. Lord, we ask a special outpouring of your mercy and your grace upon the community in Florida that suffered the horrific loss of 17 students in the 12th mass shooting event in our country this year. Lord, there is something wrong at a deep level spiritually in our nation, and we pray that you will be working for good and to allow good to triumph over evil in the midst of such tragic and challenging circumstances. Gracious Father, we know too that you are aware of all the people connected to us and our lives who are in need of healing and your mercy and your grace. We take this opportunity now to name before you in the silence of our individual thoughts and prayers those who have not yet been mentioned or lifted up publicly this day. Gracious Father, hear our silent petitions and prayers.
you. So we'll ask the ushers to come forward as we present to God his tithe and our offering. <laughs> Jesus' comments to the Sadducees are a question of priorities. What, what is it that we prioritize in life? I was thinking about this when the expert in the law challenged Jesus. Jesus would say that many things were important regarding our relationship with God. But the attempt of the Sadducee was what's most important. And Jesus had the answer. Love God and love your neighbor. Those are the priorities of Jesus Christ and those are indeed the priorities that God teaches us matter most to Him. Thinking about how we prioritize things in our daily lives. We have medical professionals here in the congregation, physicians, nurses, and there is a concept that 
I've never done, but I've heard about, called triage. Triage is how you prioritize patients. If five people come in at the same time, the medical professional, the care provider, has to know which person goes to the front of the line. Can I pick on you, Ray? Sure. Okay, what, what, what would be first? Breathing or bleeding? It depends, right? <laughs> yeah. Breathing. 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 Yeah. No ABCs. Yeah. A ABCs, what's that? Airway, breathing, and circulation. Airway, breathing, and circulation. Okay. All right, let's, let's go uh, a little bit further down the list. Um, as a Boy Scout, I learned some survival training, and I learned the rule of threes. The rule of threes says that the number three matters in survival. And this is a rule of thumb. It's kind of a law, but not really. But it gives you some, some ideas. You can live three minutes without air. You can probably survive three hours without shelter, without protection from the weather. Most people can live three days without water. And believe it or not, I know it's hard to believe, but you can live for probably three weeks without food. So the rule of threes, air, shelter, water, and food. So if you're in a survival situation, it helps you prioritize. I myself, if I was in a survival situation, would be immediately looking for food. <laughs> but I know that shelter matters more, and water matters more than food. So there are rules, there are suggestions, there are guidelines for what is important. Jesus teaches us that in God's eyes and in his eyes, in his teachings, what was most important was to love God and love your neighbor. But we in modern day society have distorted, I think, a little bit what love means. We have come to a modern interpretation of love thinking romantic love, romantic intentions, warm fuzzies. We think that when we love someone, it's a feeling, right? I can remember middle school when everybody had feelings for everybody else that were never <coughs> expressed or acted upon. We had classrooms of people looking at each other with moody eyes. Boys had crushes on girls that they never expressed. Girls had crushes on boys that they never expressed. There was no action taken. There was a lot of emotion, but no follow through. I have a great story about middle school romance. My son got phone calls from a, a girl in his class. She always wanted to talk to him because she had a crush on him. And uh, he was oblivious. Typical keeper, I suppose. But she would call him up and talk to him. And then at the end of the conversation, she would do the, the game that girls like to play on the phone. You know, you know the game? You hang up first. Yep. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's time to hang up. You hang up first. And then if you're playing the game properly, you say, no, you hang up first. No, you hang up. And it's, it's supposed to go back and forth for a little bit. My son, I got a fist pump, and then my wife yelled at me. The girl says, well, it's time to say goodbye, Chris. He says, okay, goodbye. She says, you hang up first. He said, okay, click. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> My wife says, oh, you're horrible. I said, what? He followed instructions. That's what I thought you girls wanted, was a man who would follow instructions. <laughs> love God and love your neighbor is more than a warm, fuzzy emotion. Loving 
your neighbor and loving God requires an action. It requires some form of activity. Love is a choice. When I do premarital preparations with couples, I always tell them that love is a wonderful thing and that feelings are wonderful things, but sometimes love transcends feelings. I had a lady friend from a previous church who was in her 70s. She had been married for 50 years and her husband was a difficult man. And I said to her one time, hey, I heard you celebrated your 50th anniversary. She said, I sure did. And past her, all I could think of is if I had killed him when I should have, I'd be a free woman today. <laughs> Love is a choice. Love is a choice that we make every day. We choose to love another person. We choose to absorb negative comments. We choose to ignore negative circumstances. We choose to forgive unintentional slights. We choose to put the other person's desires ahead of our own occasionally. We do what is best for us as a couple rather than what is best for us as an individual at times. In short, when we love someone, we demonstrate that love through the choices that we make and the way that we live our lives. The best example in Scripture that Jesus teaches is the parable of the Good Samaritan. The Samaritan was a shocking choice to be the hero of a Jewish story because the Samaritans were seen as people who practiced a polluted form of Jewish religion. The Samaritans had some elements of Jewish religion and they also had some elements of pagan religion. And the Jewish people found that to be very, very, very offensive. And so they ostracized the Samaritans. They didn't want anything to do with them. They just wanted those people to live over there, stay over there, not interact with them. Because they were polluted people. And they were ritually impure. So for Jesus to make the Good Samaritan the hero of a story about loving your neighbor was shocking. But the Samaritan did not love the injured person with a warm, fuzzy feeling in his heart. He didn't say, as we record in the book of James, neighbor, go and be warm and well fed. God bless you. Warm intentions, but no follow through. No. The Samaritan picked up the wounded man, took him to a hotel, bound his wounds, and paid for his care. He demonstrated compassion. And that, my friends, is the root of love as demonstrated in the theology and in the practice of Jesus. Love is compassion. It is showing care for the other person. It is meeting needs that the other person has. It is providing for them something that is necessary for them to thrive. Now, I mentioned earlier today that there were people that were shot and killed in a mass shooting in Florida. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that. So I'm struggling a little bit with what do we do with negative emotions when something horrible happens. I am 
I'm really struggling with the idea that this is the 12th time in 2018 that there was a mass shooting event where a lot of people were injured and killed. And I went into the scriptures for this, and I was given a leading to share with you Ecclesiastes. And you're probably all familiar with what I'm going to share with you. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. There is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. And friends, I'm thinking that in this juncture, we are at a time in the life of our church and in the life of our nation when it is time a time to mourn. We need to mourn and to acknowledge the sense of loss that we have for the lives that were taken so tragically. I also want to remind you that even though we, in our human wisdom, do not have answers to why and how evil seems to triumph over good, we do know that God is sovereign and that someday, in some way, God will provide justice. I was led in my devotions this week to Psalm 28. I will close with Psalm 28. To you, I call, to you I call, O Lord, my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me. For if you remain silent, I will be like those who have gone down to the pit. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help, as I lift up my hands towards your most holy place. Do not drag me away with the wicked. Protect me from those who do evil, who speak cordially with their neighbors but harbor malice in their hearts. Lord, repay them for their deeds and for their evil work. Repay them for what their hands have done, and bring upon them what they deserve. Since they show no regard for the works of the Lord and what His hands have done, He will tear them down and not build them up again. Praise be to the Lord, for He has heard my cry of mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield, and my heart trusts in Him. My heart leaps for joy, and I will give thanks to him in songs of praise. The Lord is the strength of his people, a fortress of salvation for his anointed ones. Save your people, O Lord, and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd and carry them forevermore. Friends, being a Christian does not mean that we understand everything and that we have all of the answers all of the time. Being a Christian for us is that we believe in a sovereign God and we believe in a redeeming Jesus Christ. And we know that help is available for those of us who will ask it. I said in the beginning of my remarks that love is a choice. Love is an action. We who are Christian need to be involved in the work of creating a world where people are valued and accepted and embraced. The young man who went into the high school, the high school in Florida, I'm reading, was 
bullied and rejected, ostracized, demonized. He was made to feel unwelcome and unappreciated. And, and that doesn't give him the right to take life. But I have to wonder, in light of the scriptures that say compassion is the key to the Christian journey, I'm wondering how far a little compassion would have gone in his life. We don't know, and we will never know. But what we do know is that one day he will stand before the Lord and give an accounting for his choices and his actions, as will we all. And I'm wondering whether or not the compassion that we show to others will be shown to us in equal measure when we stand before the Lord. Jesus assures us that the most important thing we can do for each other is to demonstrate loving God and loving our neighbors. I close this morning here with an encouragement that in the Lenten season, I pray that we will all be able to not just feel a love for God in our hearts, but seek Jesus in our devotions and prayers and demonstrate in concrete ways the love that we bear for God and neighbor in ways that will bear fruit in his name and for his further glory. Amen. Friends, I invite you to rise as you are able for our closing hymn, number 203, Hail to the Lord's Amendment.
continue your individual journeys. Stay attuned to the presence of God who created you and follow Jesus throughout your life as you are led by the Holy Spirit into new life. Let us go in peace and let us stay in peace. Amen. Amen.